Genesis Briar Peerage first received recognition with the 1969 founding of Come Transmissions, a confrontational performance collective heavily influenced by Dada, which was later transformed into the band Throbbing Gristle. Peorage went on to found the groundbreaking band Psychic TV. In the 1990s, Peorage began a collaboration with the performance artist Lady J. Briar, which focused on a single central concern, deconstructing the fiction of self. Influenced by cut-up techniques and frustrated by what they felt to be imposed limits on personal and expressive identity and on the language of true love, P. Orridge and Lady J. applied the strategy of cutting up to their own bodies in an effort to merge their two identities. Through plastic surgery, hormone therapy, cross-dressing, and altered behavior into a single heterogeneous character, Briar P. Orridge. Genesis Peorage and Briar Peorage have exhibited internationally in the catalog 30 Years of Being Cut Up, a three-decade retrospective, a photo montage, and expanded Polaroids published by Invisible Exports to accompany a 2009 retrospective, is available for sale tonight, as is The Psychic Bible, published by Feral House in 2010, and Useless Magazine, which contains an enlightening conversation with Adam Baran. Um, I'd just like to say that Lonely Christopher's book is also available at the register. Uh, please welcome musician, artist, author, cultural engineer, Genesis Breyer Peter. Wow. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to sit down. I got in a taxi on the way here, and the taxi driver said to me, My God, you look so tired. I just thought, shit. <laughs> if Delancey Cars are saying that, then I really must be tired. So, with that excuse, I'm going to sit up here. And I can see everybody that way, too. It's going to be like one of those rock and roll kids where you can't get to stay still. What do you say about that? <laughs> Bible uh, was edited by a friend of ours, Jason Louv, as well as many others within our, in our sort of extended family. It was reduced from 10,000 or so pages from 18 different countries, probably, into 540. There is a French translation, and it's the same text, but for some reason in French. It's 740 pages. So that says a lot about language. Um, it doesn't seem worth reading from this until we tell you a little bit about what we were trying to do. Some of you may know, some of you may not. Uh, there was a quick mention of the 60s in the introduction. Uh, ever since we ran away from home in 1968, We've basically lived in collective or communal settings. We've not been one of those people who, surprisingly, always wanted our name up in lights. We always wanted everyone's name up in lights. And so, basically, from the beginning, my interest was to be drawn to those groups of people who were experimenting with alternative ways of living, and through that, alternative ways of being. And although that was what we were thinking in 68, it remains what we're thinking right now. So that's the basic theme of everything. When you start to live communally, as we did in this first group that we ran into, the Exploding Galaxy, back in 1968, um, it was a very rigorous, very physical, very much um, property-oriented um, approach to changing ways of living together. So, for example, the semi-squatted house that we were living in, we knocked out as many walls as we could without the house falling down. And most of all, we knocked out the doors of the toilets, the bathrooms. So there was no privacy at all for even the most 
technically intimate activities. Uh, you couldn't sleep in the same place twice, two nights running. You just had a sleeping bag or a blanket. Uh, you couldn't wear the same clothes, two days running. All the clothes that everybody had were in one box. Whoever got up first put on the clothes they liked the best that day. Whoever got up last was either naked or wearing something very weird. That was usually me. <laughs> um, and all the money was put in a box too. So if you wanted money for something, you had to convince everybody else that there was no other way to do whatever it was that you intended without money. So if you said, well, I really need to get across London to see this person, to borrow this car tire, to make a sculpture for the event that we're doing next week, they would say, can't you walk there? We've got a week. That's plenty of time. <laughs> and you would have to go, you're right. And by the walking there, you would have all sorts of amazing adventures, of course. <laughs> Now, this is one of the things that bothers me about what happens today with the internet. You miss out on all these incredible adventures. You think, where's St. Mark's bookshop? Is it actually on St. Mark's? This is what happened tonight, of course. Is it, or is it on 3rd Avenue? Because the taxi driver will ask, and I'm obviously very tired. So, we looked it up. And we found where it was. But with other things, people do the same thing. I need a book on this, or I need information about that. And they just click. Now, when it was my turn, back then in the 60s, the early 70s, to try and find a book by, say, William S. Burroughs, there were no shops in the middle of Britain, in Birmingham, that sold anything by the beatniks. They didn't know who they were. If they did, they would say, that filthy stuff. So to get a book by Burroughs or Geisin, you would have to hitchhike all the way down Britain to London, find somewhere to sleep or sleep in a doorway, which we often did, but then go around Soho. Now Soho was the red light district then. And the only places that sold Henry Miller, Jean Jean, and William Burroughs were the porno shops, because they'd heard that they were dirty books. So then you would go in and you would meet these people in the shops, steal the books when they weren't looking, and uh, make friends. Try not to have to buy any of the pictures. And what I'm saying is that there's this huge adventure. The gay man in the Rolls Royce who wanted to touch me up on the way down in the car, hitchhiking. And the people who turned out to be running Oz magazine who asked me to write poetry for them. All those different things, direct contact, directly meeting people, finding out things you would never otherwise know, that doesn't happen when you just go click. And it's a tremendous loss of experience. It's a tremendous loss of information that you don't expect. And that's really important, searching for things that you don't expect. So there we were in this house, all of us trying to make each other as uncomfortable as possible, and we had the right to just go, stop. And then someone might say, why are you using a knife and fork to eat your food? Doesn't everybody do that? Isn't there another way? And you could, of course, say chopsticks, and then, they would say, well, what about something new, something different? Can't you come up with some other way? And by doing that, people were pushed again and again. How to find new ways to do things. How to wear things differently. How to create new ways of thinking. And what we realized bit by bit was that we were really trying to absolutely and utterly erase all the personality that everybody else we'd known at school, at home, and amongst our friends, had spent their lives trying to make us be. We didn't want to be that person. We wanted the right to choose to be whatever we felt we were. And that included fantasy. And so that's where the shift went from property and the sharing of property 
which we still believe in as far as we can, to the changing of how you feel, think, and behave. And that requires something that we've noticed also recently has disappeared to some degree, and that's trust. Having lived in different communes for over 40 years in collective situations, we've noticed that it's harder and harder for people to share what they have. The only thing people will give you without a second thought in America is their car keys. Don't ask me why, but it's something we've noticed. That was something we were always very excited about when we first got here. So, we went through various different incarnations with true transmissions. We began taking the idea of the box of clothes further. We had a room of clothes. It was called the costume room, of course. And in it were various characters, outfits that you could choose to wear. One of them was uh, a grown-up baby. And it was a giant romper suit with a pacifier and a little hat little gloves, mittens, and a giant wooden pram that we built so that people could get in, pushed around. There was Mr. Alien Brain, who is still with us to this day. Uh, Mr. Alien Brain, of course, is a visitor from some, uh, some other space-time continuum and trying to understand what human beings are, why they behave, how they do, why they worship what they do, which seems to be mainly little electrical boxes. Um, and uh, there was Mrs. Uh, Harriet Straitlace. She was uh, in her late 40s, very angry about everything that changed since the 50s. It's not how it used to be. When I was young, it wasn't like this. People didn't behave like this. Young people dressed nicely and did as they were told. That kind of person. So every Friday, we would gather and we would choose which person to be. For three solid days, you had to stay in character. You wore the outfit and you behaved as that person, night and day, no matter what, out in the street, back at home, you had to become someone else. And of course, what you discover is all sorts of weaknesses in your own character and also strengths in other people's characters you didn't expect. But what we came across then was that it really wasn't even about just characters, although it is wonderful to reduce yourself down to the point of being almost a blank piece of paper where you can write your own narrative fast. You can change your name, you can change your your, uh, your story, your history, you can lie, you can make up anything you like about who you are and what you want to be, and you can become someone else and constantly redesign yourself. But how does that relate to gender? And how does that relate to sexuality? There are still so many rules, so very many strong imposed rules, imposed by violence, let's get real here. People obey laws, rules, and regulations because of a hidden intimation of violence, into intimidation. Most people would behave very differently, even if it was just taking drugs openly in the street, if there were no laws that said, you will be punished. So punishment is behind how we behave. Is there a way to escape that? Is there even a good reason for punishment? How do you find where those, those lines are? What are the lines we cross? And where are they really... Um, where do we really see them? I need a bit of water. <coughs> Dry throat. Um, for example, when you go to sleep, what's the moment, and can you ever remember the moment between when you were awake and then you were asleep? Where is 
that interface where there is that line. Is there a line? It seems as they started to check particle physics that in fact there's huge gaps between everything. And if you took one tiny particle of part of one atom and then made an accurate model of the distance between it and another particle of the same atom, it could be a hundred miles before you got to the next bit of a so-called solid item. <coughs> so where are the edges of anything? Where does anything start and finish? There are no edges. So then we began to play, obviously first, with male-female. And a lot of our performances were about uh, exchanging clothes and then um, thinking about things like, okay, I'm told it's all right to masturbate in bed, but why is it not okay to masturbate in an art gallery? Or is it? Perhaps it is. Is it okay to masturbate on a bus? No. Why not? Who makes these rules? And do they serve a purpose? So we began to get more and more interested in not just where those boundaries were and who created them and what was their function, which we felt mainly was repression, but also how much is real and how much is not. So we began to do things with wounding. Um, obviously we were using the idea of blood for many obvious reasons, menstruation, um, life, death, prettiness, it's very pretty stuff. Um, and cozy, fanny tutti, would create fake wounding using fruit, crushing up apricots and tomatoes, and people would think that those wounds were real and be shocked. Myself would, of course, be slicing and cutting real wounds in a very matter-of-fact way. And nobody was interested for two reasons. I didn't have any breasts, and I wasn't naked. Cozy had breasts and was naked. And that was what made the difference between where the attention went, not what was real. Now that takes us up to a point where we're thinking, here we are, we've gone all this way, we've knocked ourselves down, we've looked as far as we can into um, the possibility of really creating oneself. But when you've done that, when you've made the choice to build yourself as an individual, where does that have to go? It has to go back into a community, or it's just selfishness and it's just self-serving. So we began to think about ways to set up community. And that's when the Temple of Psyche Youth began. One thing we want to get clear about that name, the reason we used the word temple was because it's where you hit somebody to knock them out. Nothing to do with churches at all. 